Pinocchio here from College Aid Pro. It's that time of year again when we get to submit the CSS profile. So what I want to do today is walk you through how to submit this form and some tips and tricks and hopefully relieve some stress and anxiety around completing and submitting this form. So before you get in there, um, log in and start to complete it, you're going to need some information. So what I want you to do is make sure you have your 2022 tax returns. And if your child submitted a return, if they're required to file or they filed, you're going to need their information as well. And your W-2s, everything that goes along with your tax return, all the schedules, you're going to want all of that. Also information about your assets and then information about any of your real estate, the primary home you live in, so mortgage information, value, and any other real estate you might own, as well as if you um, own a business, just information around that. If you have that all handy, it's going to make it easier and, and just faster to submit the form. So what I'm going to do is share my screen and let's look at where you go to start this process. So you're going to go, you can just Google CSS profile application. You're going to end up, the first link will take you here. So you want to make sure that you're clicking on, and I'm going to stop my video here so it's not distracting for you. Um, you want to make sure you click on the fall 2024, spring 2025 school year. That's the year that you, um, you're applying for, and that's what we're going to be going through. So when you click on this link, this is where you're going to put in your child's login information if you're the custodial parent. So if your child has taken AP classes, PSAT, SAT, they most likely have a College Board login. If they don't, you can just click create account and go through those prompts to do it, but most likely they do. So you're going to submit the email address and then the password. So I will go ahead and log in here and then we'll be on the dashboard. So you've logged in and now you're going to be on your dashboard. So I've gone ahead and set up a sample family. So your dashboard will look a little different the first time you go in. It'll say start application. Um, you won't have schools listed here. I'm going to show you how to put the schools in in a few minutes, the colleges. But this is your dashboard that you can always go back to by clicking on the word dashboard up in the top right corner. If you are divorced or separated and you say that when you're answering the beginning questions of this form, you will see this on your dashboard when you come back. And what this is doing is asking for the non-custodial parent's email address because the way it works with the CSS profile is the parent that is submitting the FAFSA with the student is the same parent that's going to go in and do the CSS profile with the student, but the non-custodial parent also has to submit what's called a non-custodial um, CSS profile. So you want to you want to supply this email address because and it's going to be asked about later. It's a it's a question later too because you both need to submit it. Both biological parents need to submit this to College Board. It's private, the two forms go separately, the colleges will see the information, but you can't see each other's information. So privacy is maintained, but you wanna make sure you provide that information so that the non-custodial parent can go ahead and start creating their non-custodial CSS profile. Now, the definition of custodial parent has changed since the 23-24 school year. So if you have older kids, you might remember that the definition was the, the parent where the child spent the most time on a year look back from when you were hitting submit, like where they slept the most nights in essence. That has changed to the parent that provides the most financial support. So <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean it's the parent that's paying the child support. You, you definitely want to think about this and figure out um, which parent is providing the most financial support. And if you're not going to submit this for a month or two or whatever the deadlines are, you, can, you, you might have some time to kind of 
figure this out, to get out some spreadsheets, to create them and really figure out who's providing the most support. And if, if you're a family that's 50-50, pretty close to the same amount of money, if one parent is better to submit, you might want to you might want to um, have that parent provide a little bit more support. This is more advice for the FAFSA where only one parent is submitting. So I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but for the CSS profile, you're both going to be sending it. There are some schools that only look at the custodial parent, but they most of them will look at both parents' details. So you want to make sure, again, you provide that email address. So let's go into the actual form. So because I've already done this, this is all you can see these all these sections are complete, most of them at least, um, because I, I went in ahead of time so that you're not bored with me going through some of the te you know, some of the stuff where you don't need my help, right? Name, address, that sort of thing. As you complete sections, you will see them look like this. And as you can tell, you can go in and edit the answers. So don't worry if you're not sure, if you're not sure about something and it requires you to put a zero there, just make a note of what section it was and you can always go back and edit it. And at the end, there's gonna be another opportunity to review everything. So they wanna make sure that you've got it all dialed in. So I am not gonna go through each section. Some of these are pretty self-explanatory as far as what you need to do or what the answers are. But the one thing I will tell you for the whole form is if a question is not required, you don't need to answer it. And we recommend in most cases, you do not answer it. You're gonna submit tax returns and W-2s and all your information. These colleges are gonna require you to securely upload it through either IDOC or through another portal that they use. So you're not lying, you're not trying to hide. Just when it comes to financial aid forms, you wanna always be honest but less is more. So if a question isn't required, just go ahead and skip it. And I'm gonna show you some of these questions and why it might be advantageous to not disclose some of this ahead of time, because if you're going back and appealing, that's when you might wanna share it instead of now. So the first three sections are pretty self-explanatory, but I do wanna go into the academic information because I want to show you how to input colleges in here. So I'm going to just whip through some of these because this is just inputting the high school. I have to do this to get to the section that I want to show you in here. There's no way to just skip. So here we are, college program and details. So what you do here is the easiest way is you know the names of the colleges that you want to plug in. So the easiest way to, is just to say, college name and then go ahead and plug in the name of a college and hit search and here's Brown University that's the one you want hit select and then it's going to ask you a few questions the student is going to be starting college but it might be one of the other answers here depending on your situation so first year undergrad we're going to live on campus and the student's going to apply regular decisions. So you want to answer those questions are required. And now you'll see that Brown is on the list. OK, so you can hit save and continue. And now you've got this section. So what I want to do is leave this. So I'm going to go over to dashboard and let's make. Yeah, so it did let me did let me out, you know what, it's see, see this is, is good for you to see. What it's making me do is continue, it's it, it, you, once you start a section, you have to go all the way through. So sorry for that. Um, hopefully this isn't making your head spin. I'm just gonna flip through these really quickly because we don't need to show that again, okay and save and continue and if they ever want you to share something don't worry it won't let you go to the next page and at the end it's going to show you any everything so next um they're going to collect some information about the parents and i noticed on the dashboard it said this was incomplete so if you look here you can see what i was talking about you see this is required so a required question 
has to be answered. This is an important question to bring up. The social security number is not required. I am not telling you what to do here. Some schools use the social security number to track and match when the student applies with the paperwork. So we have had a few instances with the families that we've supported where they say it isn't, it hasn't been submitted when it has, and that's because they're using social security numbers to match. So it's kind of your call if you want to provide it. Like I said earlier, you're going to be uploading documents that have your social security number, your tax return, your W-2s. So they, it's, they are going to see it. So it's not required. So it's kind of up to you if you want to put it in here for tracking reasons or not totally up to you. So that's one situation where I just want to call that out because it's not required. Um, email address, you've got to put that in the state. They ask the, the education level of the parents. I honestly wouldn't provide that. If you look here, you see the more data they have, if you have a PhD, they're probably going to make assumptions about your financial life, right or wrong but they might be making assumptions. So again, that's one that I would probably leave. It's not required. Plus, it makes it go so much faster if you don't answer the not required questions. Now, because my family is a divorced family, you notice that only the custodial parents' information was asked about. If you're married, you're going to see two sets of questions about each parent, just, just as an FYI. So now let's kind of get into the meat of this. So this is the parent income question. So this is required. Did you complete a tax return? Pretty, pretty clear what they're asking here. Again, what kind of return did you file? This family did a 1040. What's the tax filing status? This is head of household because this family's divorced. If you're married, you're going to put married filing joint. And as I said at the beginning, you should have your tax return right there. If it's on soft copy on your computer, or if you've got a hard copy in front of you, just look on it if you're not sure. And make sure you've got that dialed in. So now they're saying we're going to what you need to have handy and what kind of questions they're going to ask here. So this is asking for the adjusted gross income. They give you the line on the tax return. So don't think you know better and you're going to put a different line. Put what they ask. Now, you'll notice the second question is not required about the Schedule 1. And there's a yes or no. So you don't have to answer it because it's not required. But I will tell you, once you pick one of these, so if I were to say, oh, I don't, or yes, I do, you can't unclick it. All you can do is toggle between them. So if you're not going to answer the question, do not click yes or no, because once you've done it, then you got to answer the question, whichever qu answer is correct for your family. So that's just something to keep in mind throughout the form. They're asking if you have a Schedule 3. Those aren't required, so we're going to leave those blank. Then we get in here. These are questions right off of the, the lines on your 1040. This is required, so you've got to put that in. The other items are not. Same thing here. None of these are required, so you can just scroll through these and leave them blank. They are going to get your 1040 and they are going to see all this. Okay, this question is required and you need to put line 22. People say all the time, well, what about the line below it? That's all of my tax. Put This is your federal income tax. So you definitely want to follow the instructions and put line 22 here. Okay, how much did this bill is the dad earn from work. If you have a question about what that means, you can click on this and it tells you from W-2s, it tells you where you're going to find that number. They ask for this because they're going to calculate the Social Security and Medicare that you're paying as a taxpayer. And that's a good thing in financial aid because that's money that you're not receiving. And so you can't use it to pay for college, right? So that's what they're asking that. That's why they're asking that. A couple more questions. This is about your contributions. Did you do pre-tax, tax deferred just means pre-tax. You didn't pay tax on it into like a 401k or 403b. Again, if you click here, 
it tells you on the W-2 in box 12 exactly what you want to put there. These letter codes, it'll say D-10,000. That means you put that much. I believe D is, is for your 401k. That's what you're going to want to put, put there. They're very clear on other things that you might see in there that you absolutely don't want to put. It's just the codes from your W-2 that they're, they're mentioning in your this little help box. If you made other pre-tax contributions, you do not put them here. Those show up on your tax return. And the other thing about this, if you are required to save in your 403B or 401k, if it's, if it's not voluntary, then you do not have to disclose that. And these funds are added into your income. So it actually hurts you when they're calculating your student aid index. You need to be honest. I'm just telling you that, that you don't want to inflate this number um, by making an error. And if your contributions, for example, I live outside of Seattle and the University of Washington requires all their employees to put money into what they call their UWRP, it's their retirement plan. Those employees don't have to disclose it here because they have no choice. As an employee, they have to put a certain percent in. If you have an HSA, go ahead and include that. Those are both required questions. Now let's go to parent income and benefits. This is not a required question. So you can skip through that. If, if, you, um, if you received alimony, you've got to put that down here and also housing, food and other living allowances. And there's some details there for you. If, if it's zero, you need to put zero or it'll give you an error message and you can't move on. Other untaxed income, they give you some examples here. What the, what this is, is it's it's money that you're not taxed on by the federal government, but that will be added into the calculation of your need-based eligibility in essence. Um, now they're asking about 2023. And you might be thinking, why are they doing that? Because this is all based on 2022. And you're exactly right. These numbers are not part of this calculation. My advice when you're filling this out, because these three questions are required, is if you don't know what you're going to be making, if you're a salesperson and and work on commission and you're not sure what next year is going to look like, or you, but you know what, for 2023, you're already in 2023. So what you want to put is the lowest amount you're going to make. Again, be honest, but don't overestimate, oh my gosh, if I make this big sale, I could, you know, double what I, what I've made year to date. You want to be honest, but the lowest amount you think you're going to make through the end of the year. And so income, other taxable income, that means dividends and interest, that sort of stuff. And then untaxed income and benefits for most people, that's going to be what you're putting in a 401k, 403b. They ask about that. And I just put that as what that is. That's 5,000 that I'm going to be putting in this year into a pre-tax retirement account. So that's what they're asking for there. Um, those are all required. Okay. Uh, do you expect any change? See, I clicked no here, so I'll show you this. You have to answer this. So you click no. But what I was saying to you earlier, if you just said, oh, I really meant to say yes, or you know what, this is this is required, so you have to answer it. But you see what I mean? That you all you can do is toggle between them. So this is required. So answer the question honestly and move on. Um, all of these questions about parent benefits are not required. And part of that is that if none of these are applicable to you, they can't require you to answer it. This one you could mark because this gives them some insight into, into your family financial situation. So if you wanted to click on any of these, you could. It's not wrong to leave them blank. But this is showing that you do have need and your income is relatively low. And as always, there's little cheat sheets here if you want to know. So I'm going to leave those blank for this. Now we're going into parent employment. This is not required, so don't answer it. What dad does for a living, this one, he's not a veteran. You got to answer that one. 
the occupation, how long he's been there, just leave it blank. See, it, it helps you move through this. What retirement plans do you have? Don't click anything there. This question is required, and it used to not be required, but as of last year, they made it a required question, which, um, to be totally transparent, bothers me. Retirement assets are not part of the equation when they calculate your student aid index that they use to figure out your need. Be that as it may, it is a required question, and you you should be honest on these forms. I have some parents who are just like, I am not filling that in. It's none of their business. That's your call, how you want to handle it. But what, what I have to say as a professional giving you advice is it's a required question, so you do need to answer it. And uh, you should be honest on forms. I will say some of the guidance that we've gotten from some of our experts on our team at CAP who actually work behind the scenes at Harvard's uh, School of Medicine and MIT um, and, and Southern Cal have shared, you know, if you have a low balance, that's actually a good thing to share. It's, it could be a positive because the college can look and see, hey, well, mom and dad are like in their late 50s. And they don't have too much saved for college. So they might take that into account to say, you know, we we might need to be a little bit more generous. No guarantees, but they've said that sometimes that's how a college can look at it. So just keep that in mind. So that, but that question is required. Um, so you you've you've got to answer it in some capacity. These are questions about um, the non-custodial parent. So, like I said, they're going to ask this again. So you can go ahead, if you know this, you can put it in. It's not required. So if you'd, oh yes, it is required, sorry. If, you know, so provide it. If you don't know where your ex is, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing that if you don't know where your ex is, I would just fill in something here, put unknown, because it won't let you go forward if um, it's a required question. If you know, you can put it in. You want them to get a hold of the non-custodial parent so that your child's um, financial application, financial aid form application is complete with both parents in there, okay? Um, more required questions. You won't have this if you're married because this, this is because my sample family is divorced, but I wanted to make sure divorced and separated families see this. So two questions about um, years when things happened, the occupation of the non-custodial parent. Even if you know, you can put on no. If you're not sure because you don't talk to your ex that often and they could have gotten a promotion, you can put unknown. Again, your ex is going to be submitting the non-custodial form. So they're, they're going to be asking these questions of that person. This question is saying, hey, the non-custodial biological parent, how much can they contribute? I would not touch this with a 10-foot pole. I would put zero. Let that person address that question when they are submitting their form. Because if you put a number that's too high, the college is going to use that to determine need-based eligibility. So just be very, very careful. Is there any sort of written agreement? You have to say yes or no here. So answer that appropriately. They're again asking for that email address, just like they did on your dashboard, which is, as I said, important, uh, very important to, to provide. Okay, the housing piece is pretty straightforward. So this, this helps you see how you can go back and forth here. So let me, I'm gonna skip the housing information. Um, and the household summary. That's where you're going to add siblings, that sort of thing. If you have somebody living in your home that you're providing so over half support for, like a grandparent, they're going to be part of your household. And there's an opportunity to add all that if you're remarried, your new spouse, all of that stuff goes in there. So now let's go down. This is a divorced family, like I said. So they're going to ask about child support. You won't see this question if you're not divorced. Uh, if you're not divorced. So did Peg, which is Peg's the student, parents receive child support? Yes or no? It's required. So if you did, you say yes. Go to the next question. How much child support? Go ahead and disclose that. And it says for all children. 
So go ahead and follow the instructions and then amount received. Then they're going to ask you the breakdown. So this is two kids, half was for this and your child that you're submitting the CSS profile for. So that's pretty straightforward. Did, um, did now when it says parents, remember, this is the custodial parent and the student. So you would only be answering one of these yes. The other parent would be saying yes. I paid child support because you don't typically receive child support and pay child support. So that's going to be a no on that one. Now they're asking about parent expenses. Did you have any medical or dental expenses? This one's a little bit touchy, right? Because any strain on cash flow is a good thing to share, but we counsel you to share that when you're appealing. Have a little you know, have a little ammunition, if you will, when you talk to the colleges instead of disclosing everything. So your call, some people really want to disclose and they don't feel comfortable. That's This is your forum. It's your call. I'm just trying to provide some guidance, but I'm going to say no here for that question. Um, repayment, again, I would not disclose any of this. It's not required. I would just leave it. Now we're into parent assets. And I wanna walk you through this section as well. And remember the only assets that we're gonna be looking at here are the non-retirement assets. So checking and savings, that's required. Um, and then they're saying, do you have any of the following assets? So I'm just gonna mark yes, because I want you to see the fields that pop up so I can walk you through this. Um, assets, they, and they is referring to the parent or parents or parent, they own but are held in the names of their children. So this question, what you want to focus on here is, are there any assets that are owned by the parent that you need to disclose here? You're not going to disclose 529s owned by the parent. That's going to come up in um, in the other section. So for most families, this is going to be a no, but you just want to think about, are there assets that are in the name of the other kids, the other siblings, if applicable to that family, that are really owned by the parent? And 529s do not fall in that category because that's actually an asset of the parents. That's going to be disclosed. Every, that's going to be disclosed here. Current market value of investments. So basically you see front and center, 529 college savings account. So that's if you have three kids and you have 40,000 in each account, that's 120,000. So that's where you're gonna disclose it, not in the other question. And this is required. So you go ahead and do that. This is not required. Even though you said you had real estate, they're not asking you to disclose anything. So we're just gonna go through this. Businesses. And again, they're going to get your tax return. They're going to see you have a business or you have a farm. So don't worry about that. All right. I am going to skip student income. Let me go back to the dashboard here with you because it goes through the same questions that, um, well, you know what? Now that I think about it, I, I do want to, there's a very important section that comes out of student income that I do want to go over. It's it's popped on the end. And so I do want to go over that because it's a question that almost every parent has. So I want to make sure I hit it. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly. These are all the same questions that I already went over with you for the parent. So same exact thing, leave the ones that are um, not required blank, fill in what's required. So I'm not going to worry about any of this. None of this was required and very likely would not be applicable. Okay. They asked the same kind of questions about the student as far as expected summer earnings, expected earnings during the school year. Again, what you're going to want to do is be honest 
but don't overestimate. So if you don't know if your child's going to have a job during the school year, put zero. If your child is thinking about getting a summer job, but doesn't have anything locked in, put zero because you have no idea what their income is going to be. And you don't want to estimate. If you know your child has a job offer and you know what they're going to make, by all means, share it because it's a required question. But for most families, they don't know. So just leave it blank and don't worry about it. So this is the page that every parent has questions about, and rightly so. It's the student resources. So this question here, how much does Peg expect, remember Peg's the student, to receive from the following sources to pay for the 24-25 school year? The parents, and this is just gonna be the custodial parent for a divorced family, okay? You need to be really careful how you answer this question. For some families, if they've got a 529, it's dividing that by four. You definitely don't want to overestimate this because if you have a index, and hopefully you know what that is, that's that's what's going to get calculated from this form. So hopefully you've done some prep and you have an idea of what your student aid index is because say it's 20,000 and you put 25,000, the school's now going to say, oh, well, mom said she could pay 25,000. So now we're going to move that up to 25,000. So you don't want to overestimate and you do want to have an idea of what your student aid and you don't overestimate. And if you really have barely any ability to contribute, just be honest and put that there. If it's $100, if it's $500, just go ahead and do that. That's how that question works. So it's not going to help you, but it really could hurt you if you overestimate. If there's any scholarships or grants, you want to put those down other than what the colleges and universities are offering. Again, if you don't know for 100% certainty that a scholarship is coming in, put zero. Same thing for any employer benefits that might be there. The last question here about relatives other than the parents that are going to provide help, same thing. Unless you know for sure that grandma said, I want to give $5,000 to junior for the 24-25 school year, if that's not set in stone, don't put, put zero because this is going to be taken into account. If there's an outside source of help, that's going to lower what the college might give you and rightly so because there's money coming in. So don't hurt yourself by saying, well, grandma said three years ago she was going to give $20,000. Let's just assume that's going to happen. Don't do that. If you don't know for sure, you're going to want to put zero there or you're going to want to put the minimum that you know for sure. Okay, the next section is about student assets. I'll flip through this really quickly because I want to show you investments are the same, but a trust. If your child is a beneficiary of a trust, again, you got to be honest and say yes here. So they're asking questions about checking and savings, investments. A lot of kids don't have a portfolio and investments, but they do put it down. What is the current value of all trusts that the student is beneficiary of? Go ahead and put that amount. Then they're going to ask a little bit about the trust, which these are new questions as of last year, and I think they're pretty good. Um, is any part of the principal um, of the trust currently available? There are some trusts that say the beneficiaries can't access it until the age of 30 or 25. So that definitely mark, no, they're not available. Then they ask who created the trust. So pick whatever's applicable and then what type of trust. And if this is this is information that you're going to want to have handy when I said assets, this is part of the assets. So that's how it works with trusts. I will tell you that you can appeal to a college if they decide to use a trust in the equation. So keep that in mind. Um, does the student have any retirement assets? That's not required. So you 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 didn't need to answer that first toggle. So we are getting to the end. We're almost there, everybody. So special circumstances. This is where you can click one of these and you can share some information with the colleges. I recommend you do not do that. All of us at College Aid Pro, that is our that is our recommendation because as I said earlier, you want to get a financial aid package from the colleges when your child's admitted. 
And then you want to be able to go back and say, yeah, but I have big medical expenses coming up. Um, I had some this year and I'm going to have more surgeries next year, or I was affected by COVID or I'm retired now, whatever it is. It's better to do that. You have, you're more in a position of power if you go to the colleges and say, okay, thank you for your package, but I need to tell you some new things so that um, you can, you can um, go in and change my package, hopefully for the better and get some more endowment money from the college. So that's what we recommend you do. Click none and move on. Now, this last section, you may or may not see. It depends on the colleges that you're submitting the CSS profile. There's a bank of supplemental questions. And some colleges will say, I want to ask um, the applicants, you know, one, question one, question 50, and question 25, whatever those are. So when you go in here, you may see this. And you may not. If, if all the colleges have not chosen to ask supplemental questions, then you won't even see this part. So as you're going to notice, and you're, you're probably getting used to me saying this, these are all questions required, not required, but asked by Harvard, and you don't have to answer them. They're not required. So I would leave them blank, but I don't want you to be thrown, oh, we got to special circumstances, we should be done. You might be done at that point, or you might not. So your call, but typically we say to leave those blank and then share your situation at the end, So or when you're appealing. So now you've completed all of the sections, like I said at the beginning, you can always go back and edit your answers before you submit but then you can review your application. So let's go in and look at this. This data checks, they're, they're telling you here that some institutions use that social security number. So as I said at the beginning, it's your call if you wanna disclose that. You're going to be uploading tax documents that have that on it. So the colleges are going to be able to access that information. So it's not required, but it's your call. And so they're they're kind of pointing that out to you here. So you can skip the review. I do, re I recommend that you do a review. It's never a bad thing to look, go through. And I, and I tell people sometimes, you know what, if you're not close to your priority financial aid deadline, if you've got a week or whatever, you know, go ahead and do it. And then maybe come back with a fresh set of eyes later in the day or the next morning and review it because something might jump out at you or maybe have your spouse look over it. You can complete this over multiple days. You can go in and do one section and save and then come back. So that's, that's a really nice piece. You don't have to sit down and go through the whole form together. I mean, at one time, like I'm, like I'm doing with you today. But as you can see, you can go through and you can see all these sections and you can edit any of them, right? So as you go through it, it, it makes you go through just like all the stuff in this form. You have to go section by section by section through it. But again, I would take your time. And if you do this whole form in one sitting, you probably are going to want to take a break unless you're close to a deadline. And I always recommend submitting these forms a week before your earliest deadline. So you need to go and see the deadline for all the colleges. And, um, and then, like I said, go in early. Don't be in a stressful situation where you need to submit it and something happens, you lose connectivity, or last year the CSS profile site was kind of slow and very slow sometimes, and it was hard for people to get through it. Um, I'm not gonna take you through um, all of these pages. I, I'm just gonna talk you through what it looks like from there. So you're done. So definitely review, go through the application review, look at all of them. If something jumps out at you, what was I thinking when I put that? Go check the number, whatever it happens to be. And then when you're done, you can't 
not, you're going to know when you submit this because you have to pay, like I said earlier. So once you've done your review, you know everything is good, you've got all the schools in there, make sure if you start this and within the week of doing it, say your child decides they're not applying to Occidental, go in there and delete that because you've got to pay for each school. And on the flip side, if a new school has been added, definitely go in there and make sure that it's added. And then you're going to you're going to see all the schools listed, you're going to put in your credit card and you're going to hit submit and you'll get a confirmation that you've submitted it. If it's a if it's a screenshot, take a picture of it, do a uh, print to PDF, but just capture the confirmation that you submitted the form. So that's the CSS profile. Um, it is live now, so you can get in there, but definitely look up the deadlines. And the best place to find that, the most, I would say maybe not best, but the definite most accurate place is on the college's website. So be really careful taking deadlines from other places because if they haven't updated the website and you miss a deadline, um, that can really, really hurt a financial aid package if you miss the financial aid priority deadline. So I really hope this was helpful and you can get through the CSS profile with the least amount of stress um, and anxiety. And then that's one piece of the puzzle that you have done. So as always, happy planning. Music